any type of stress, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional stress, good stress, bad stress, causes a release of endocannabinoids. And so if you're in chronic pain, your body's borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to circumvent and offset that deficiency. So we need cannabis from the outside in to be able to replenish that and maintain, as you stated so beautifully, the homeostasis, the balance. And so it's about maintaining the balance, the homeostasis, and that tonality to be able to have a, a body free of this ease or lack of ease. So from there, now we know the basis. Okay, we've got an endocannabinoid system. We have a deficiency. We must replenish it. And this is how we do so. So by doing that, it's phenomenal. Then now we add the components of the genetics. I too underwent that genetic testing. Welcome back to the Smarter Not Harder podcast, your home for one cent solutions to $64,000 questions. I'm your host, Jodie Duval. In this episode, we have the privilege of delving into the world of cannabis with Dr. Joseph Rosado, a true trailblazer in the medical cannabis community. Dr. Rosado, with over 40 years of experience in healthcare, has been a practicing medical and former chiropractic physician. He holds an MBA in healthcare and management and has worn multiple hats in healthcare, ranging from nurse's aide, orderly, emergency medical technician, paramedic, college professor, chiropractic, and medical physician, physician executive to clinical researcher. Dr. Rosado's pioneering efforts in advocating for medical cannabis as an alternative have positioned him as a respected authority in the field. His experience spans alternative and conventional medicine, cannabis medicine, opiate, opiate dependence and addiction, wellness and physical rehabilitation. And now, without further ado, Dr. Joseph Rosado. Welcome, and it's a pleasure to have you on, Dr. Rosado. Thank you so much for your time today. And we got here in the end, so I'm so happy. <laughs> it's always a pleasure to meet and speak with you. Thank you very much for your kind words off, uh, you know, off camera. <laughs> I, I appreciate you having purchased my book and listened to it. So uh, without further ado, let's hit it. Let's go for it, as we say in New, New York. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's roll. Um, so, you know, well, obviously what um, I wanted to go through is, firstly, is that in Hope and Healing, your book, and as you said, I did, I purchased this without even, before before even knowing anything about you, and then read the book and was completely taken aback by your your perception by your ways of putting information out and just your story. And it was just incredible. So, and I don't say that very often by being, you know, I've got shivers as I'm talking about it now. Now I think what we need for this particular beautiful medicinal plan is, is, um, you know, people really like you pushing the way forward and making it seen and, and heard as, as it is. So yes. So thank you. <laughs> <laughs> My pleasure, but I'm standing on the shoulders of greats that came way before me. Individuals yeah. like Rafael Mishulam, Lumia Hanouj, who was kind enough to write the forward to my book. Uh, for those yeah. um, that are watching and or listening that do not know who Lumia Hanouj is, he's the gentleman yeah. that named the first endocannabinoid. It was discovered by Rafael Mishulam in 1992, very, very recently. And he named it anandamide under, after the Sanskrit word ananda, which means bliss. So it is the it was the first endocannabinoid that was discovered, the first that was named. Since then, four others have been identified, discovered, and named, but that was the first. And that gentleman in a chance meeting, not that coincidences exist, but he and I met uh in Colombia in November of 2018, where he and I were at the same conference speaking. And so that's where he and I met. We hit it off. I shared with him that I was writing a book. And so, or I had written a book. He was my first beta reader, read it, loved it. And then I asked him to write the forward to it. And so, but his shoulders, Ethan Rousseau's shoulders, um, Dustin Sulak's shoulders, Sue Sisley, uh, Dr. Uma, I mean, there's, you know, quite a few individuals that came before me because 
in the state where I live and practice medicine, we were the Johnny come lately's. We applied for licensure in 2014, went before the ballot, did not pass, went back to the drawing board, went back in November of 2016, were approved. But then since then, it's evolved slowly but surely to where we are now. Uh, there's much to add to where we are. Nonetheless, from 2016 to present, it has evolved to where we are now, to where I've been fortunate enough to have seen and managed over 4,000 patients in the state. And then because of my reach abroad, thanks to the book, thanks to podcasts, interviews such as this, uh, individuals from all over the world have been able to listen and hear my message. So individuals in Fiji, where it's still illegal, Australia, where it's still illegal, Costa Rica, where it's still illegal, um, Thailand, uh, Malaysia, where it's gray, um, Rome, Japan, etc. So I've had the fortune of traveling to different countries, speaking on behalf of, as you stated earlier, this beautiful, amazing plant. Mm, absolutely. And I really want to dive into, um, you know, how and the the challenges and how it came about to prescribe um, and see that many patients. And you would have a huge case history collection, obviously, and you say that in your book too. Um, but I really want to start with a history. So let's go through the fascinating history as, as briefly as we can, I think, because there's a lot of it. Um, and, and things that you find that are the most fascinating about the history of cannabis? Well, the most fascinating thing about the history of cannabis is how hated it is. It, <laughs> it's, it's kind of like me. You either love me or hate me. There's no in between. <laughs> and it's very Listen, similar yeah. <laughs> with, with cannabis. You either yeah. love plant or you hate the plant there's no in between which is quite interesting because it's a very innocuous plant to date no one has ever died from utilizing the plant or uh, or there's no uh, way of over utilizing or overusing the plant contrary to prescription medications where people die on a regular basis from overdosages with narcotics or benzodiazepines, things like that. So uh, it's just been stigmatized and ostracized because people have failed to understand it and have passed judgment on it, which is sad. And so in the US, um, the from the mid 1800s until the mid 1900s, cannabis was part of our pharmacopoeia. It was prescribed by physicians. It was dispensed by pharmacists in pharmacies. It wasn't until the 1930s where the first drug czar, an individual by the name of Harry Aislinger, who utilized the racism and stigma of the fact that individuals from south of the border, from the country of Mexico, were crossing the border legally for... Uh, to escape the Mexican Revolution, were utilizing the cannabis plant, and he utilized the word marijuana to stigmatize it and make it even worse. And lo and behold, that word is a racist term. But then he went one step further and made claims that if our white women smoke this plant, and then they will engage in horrific sexual acts with black men, jazz singers, and Mexicans. It's like, what in the hell is going on? Not that that's a bad thing. I mean, I... <laughs> yeah, yeah, but really, like, be specific too. <laughs> that's yeah. crazy. And then thereafter, then they went on and created this movie called Reefer Madness, which going to an all-male Catholic high school in the Bronx of New York City, you know, in 1977, 1976, 1977, when I was a freshman in high school, 
we watched this video in this movie. It wasn't a video because the videos didn't exist then. It was an actual movie, real to real. And we're watching this and just all of the scenery and just the atrocities that were being pushed and promoted. And then from there, then they started hitting taxation, uh, attacking individuals that utilize the cannabis and taxing them rigorously. In my book, I quoted a scene or, um, where Thomas Jefferson was in his backyard in his back porch, rather, smoking hemp, looking at his hemp crop, and it was encouraged to use hemp to pay taxes. We were, in the United States, we were utilizing hemp to pay our taxes, and it was encouraged to do so. The uniforms of our military were made of hemp. The first American flag was made of hemp. The Declaration of Independence was written on hemp paper, but yet, it was demonized, and then, so from the 30s, it, they destroyed it to the point that in the 50s, they 1950s, they said, you know, we're, we can't continue, and they took it off of the pharmacopoeia. And then in the 70s, former President Richard Nixon had another issue with cannabis, to where he was even more verbal, talking about, you know, the N-word, and, you know, Hispanics and Jews and just, again, racism after racism and atrocities. And then fast forward to the 80s, where the spouse of then President Ronald Reagan created this propaganda, just say no. Well, we know how well that propaganda worked. And then we had other commercials on television, you know, this is your brain, and they showed an egg, and then they showed a brain in an iron skillet or the, the 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 egg in an iron skillet and say and this is your brain on drugs I mean, the fear just fear mongering yeah not understanding that this is medicine when you have children that have had two to three hundred seizures a day that is called status epilepticus they are in non-stop seizure activity and no medication that's available to them or to humans is working, they turn to veterinary medicine and utilize veterinary medications to treat these children and with a simple extract of a plant, reduce those two to 300 seizures per day to five to 10 seizures a month? How can you, how can you, in, a, in your right state of mind, make a claim that it is the, a gateway drug to injecting your arm with a drug such as heroin. The reason why there is an opiate crisis in the United States was because big pharma pushed and promoted medications that they knew were highly addictive. And I'm, I'm not speaking out of turn, there's a huge um, series on Netflix right now called, um, you know, uh, pain, uh, what was it? Uh, uh, pain pills or something. Um, th yeah. there's, there's two specific series. Uh, one was a movie and the other one was a series yeah. on Netflix about the background behind how the opiate crisis began pushing and promoting an extended release narcotic where they stated that there was a 95 percent chance that they were not going to become addicted well that was the reverse there's a 99 percent probability that you will become addicted and so teaching and pushing and focusing on all of this to this day, I've yet to know any female to sell their body for a cigarette, a cannabis cigarette. I, I, I've not seen that. I've not encountered that. I've encountered yeah. many that yeah. have offered services for a <laughs> bottle of, of rum. I've heard yeah. or, or, no, or for right. a smack <laughs> of beer or for some cocaine or, or some yeah. heroin. I've yeah. certainly heard sexual favors in exchange for those but i've yet to have been approached as a man for 
someone to smoke a joint. Have you? <laughs> no, and I've never tried either. But yeah, <laughs> <laughs> I have so many things to say around that. But I'll leave it to this. <laughs> the the point, the, yeah, with with cannabis, there's so like so many forms of it now. There's actually lubricants, and you know, with cannabis particularly, I find on this, you know, on this libido, on this sensation, it actually increases you know that spirituality, that sensation around sexuality not not the need to exploit it <laughs> so you know that that in itself is something to be further research on I think that would be fascinating but well, um, one of just, our one hmm. I'm, I'm glad you mentioned that because one hmm. of our dispensaries here in the state of Florida hmm. um uh, and I'll give them credit um I, disclaimer I don't get any money from anyone by mentioning their products um, yep. It's just that as a physician, I obviously recommend these products, but MUV Move, that yep. is in the state of Florida, they have an intravaginal spray that is promoted for women's health, not only to mm -hmm. lubricate, but also to ease menstrual pain and pelvic pain. And so it's utilized to address yep. that. On the west coast of the United States, they have tampons available that are infused with cannabis to support and assist in the management of menstrual cramps and pelvic pain during the menstrual cycle. So because THC, which has been promoted as the demon because it gets you high, but yet <laughs> THC has been proven and shown that it is 20, uh, 20 times more powerful than aspirin as an anti-inflammatory and twice as powerful as hydrocortisone as an anti-inflammatory. Now, as a physician, I know that if I give hydrocortisone or any cortisone for an extended period of time, the side effects of that medication are ridiculous. It can cause an idiopathic Cushing syndrome where they end up with a moon face, buffalo hump, can cause um, idiopathic diabetes. I mean, all kinds of adverse effects as a result of this utilization. But yet, THC has the same potency as these others. And so when you inhale it, it helps people that have CO chronic obstructive pulmonary disease, asthma, bronchitis, Etc. because we have cannabinoid receptors in our lung. And that's really the first place that we must start is educating individuals that we have an endocannabinoid system that we produce cannabis in our body. All vertebrates produce cannabis. Granted, not in the same capacity as THC, CBD, CBN, THCV, which are the phytocannabinoids, Phyto meaning plant, cannabinoids meaning that they work on the cannabinoid receptors, but we have these endocannabinoids that we produce in our body. Women in breast milk have anandamide. They pass the their endocannabinoid to their children to stimulate their endocannabinoid system because they too are vertebrates. This is a beautiful concept, but God forbid a pregnant woman or in a, a woman that's lactating utilizes cannabis. She's a devil and she is reported and they talk about removing her child from her care, but it's okay for them to receive pain medication or an anti-anxiety medication or an antidepressant medication or an amphetamine for their ADD, ADHD. Yeah, so absolutely. I, and I totally agree. Totally agree. I was going to say all those things. You know, I get so many women in my clinic who are prescribed medications while they're pregnant for the first time with no understanding of how that is going to impact them or their baby to come. So it's just crazy. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness I'm so uh I'm so happy with this conversation um so we, we you know I, I guess I, I want to just backtrack a little bit is that you know just following on from the history you know I I taught I, I've been teaching botany for, for many years 
um, up to about four years ago, in a naturopathic botany class, cannabis was still listed as a toxic plant. Can you believe it? <laughs> and that is what I find hilarious. And, you know, we quick, quickly changed that conversation around. But up until that point, naturopaths here were even learning that cannabis was a, a toxicity um, or can be dangerous in some way. But isn't it, isn't it just so um, naive to think that people can utilise something as completely dangerous without knowing any information about it and not having any more further studies or look into the data that actually is true for this particular incredible plant? So um, well, I just wanted to note that. Well, what's, what's even sadder is that industrialized countries such as yours, Australia, and mine, the United States, have this sense of arrogance that, well, if we didn't do the studies, we didn't do the research, it doesn't exist. But yet, from the 1940s, studies and research have, has been done in, in Israel. Why are they not accepting those studies? Because Rafael mm. Mishulam and Lumia Hanush started this whole process in the 40s. It was in the yeah. 1960s that the Delta 9 THC structure was actually found and discovered. And, mm. and then, you know, moving forward, you know, the endocannabinoid system, and, and that we, which we discussed, the first one being discovered in 1992. But mm. it's a relatively new science, granted, but this plant, there's documentation from back 5,000 years ago with mm -hmm. hieroglyphics from Asia because the plant is in, endogenous of that region of the world. It comes from Asia. And mm -hmm. so, and it's been utilized and it was utilized for sacred um, rituals. And there's documentation of how it was utilized for analgesia, for um mood stabilization for all kinds of reasons but yet because these respective industrialized countries say oh well it wasn't done in our university so it, it certainly cannot have any value and just the arrogance and and the uh, thought process that why don't we go beyond and get outside our heads and our boxes and realize that other people have done some beautiful, stellar studies and published amazing results on these individuals. Um, there's one company here in, in Florida um, named uh, Vitacan. They have an exclusive contract with a company in Israel called Tikkun Olam, which means to heal the world. And they have a product line where one product is called Abidecal. It's a 15 to 1 ratio based CBD to THC. It's named after the first child that utilized it. It was named after a little boy that had severe seizure activity. And they created this product for this individual. Well, I use this story in, in many of my presentations and I have a presentation on autism and cannabis and I'm on stage and I'm speaking on this in Rome, Italy, and I'm, I'm speaking on Abidecal and the 15 to 1 CBD THC and the doctor that was utilizing this product to do the studies and it was a, a couple of 2000 children and as I'm speaking. I see one individual in the audience nodding her head and smiling, similar to what you're doing now. And I'm thinking, why is this person like so, in, like really above and beyond? Because most people will nod and, and they'll smile. But this woman was like on point. I stopped my lecture and I said, what do you know about this product? Because I see as though it's, it appears to me as though you know a little bit about this. It turns out she is she was an Israeli psychiatrist and she was part of that study and some of her patients were part of that clinical trial. So I just, wow. I had instant, instant leverage right there because she was actually 
part of the study and her, some of her patients were involved in that clinical trial. And so mm. that was, I just uh, sat down and said, okay, you talk, I'm, I'm done. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing speaks like experience and stories to people who are doubtful, right? They have to hear it and see the results from someone who's experienced it. And it's so powerful. Very yeah. Much so. Yeah. So, Dr. Rosado, I, you know, I love that, you know, when I'm researching the endocannabinoid system, when you look at it as a, you know, a system within the body, obviously it's a very new system considering what we've discovered with the others. Um, however, there is not much in the human body that doesn't, well, that, that the endocannabinoid system doesn't touch. And that for that... me is like, gold you know why how how and when can you ignore this then <laughs> exactly because when, when i you know when i'm either lecturing in, a, in medical schools uh, i'm on faculty with a few medical colleges and nurse practitioner schools and nursing schools but when i'm at lecturing and i'm explaining to them you know, they've all heard of the respiratory system. They've all heard of the cardiovascular system. They've all heard of the, you know, renal system, the integumentary system. They've learned, of, they've know all of these, but the missing link and what ties all of them together, everyone thinks that it's the nerves, the nervous system that is the link that latches on and triggers everything but it's truly the endocannabinoid system because there are endocannabinoid receptors from the top of your head to the bottom of your feet and from the outside in. And every system from the skin on in has an endocannabinoid receptor, whether it's CB1, whether it's CB2, whether it's GPR55, whether it's TRPV1, 2, or 3. We have all of these receptors found everywhere. And that is, is what is kind of like the sauce that ties a dish together. You know, it, it's one, like I watch a lot of cooking shows and yeah. invariably when they're eating a dish, they'll say, you know, ha had you made a sauce, it would have tied everything together. It would have made this dish complete. The endocannabinoid system is that missing sauce. It's that special sauce that McDonald's talks about. It's the actual true special <laughs> sauce that ties everything together and makes everything work the way it's supposed to work. Yeah, I love that. Special sauce. <laughs> oh, so good, so good. But this is where, um, and I want to tie you now, is a lot where, you know, doc, Dr. Ethan Russo or Dr. Russo is uh, talking a lot about the tone and it's like any other system that has to be perfectly homeostatic but has statically balanced in that the tone of the endocannabinoid system really points out these details for that um for, for the for the analysis of where they're lying for need of endocannabinoids or cannabinoids should i say um or then even diving into and i want to sort of bring this up now then i want to go into your your turning points and things like that but um, Len with Endocana talks about the ability to break down our, our you know, anandamide too quickly. Like I did a test with him on it and I have FAAH and then I break down anandamide a lot. So I need to run really fast all the time <laughs> to get my own anandamide. But, you know, there, there is a component of how our genetics deal with the endocannabinoid system. And also mm -hmm. the point of what I love that he does is the opioid testing, the addiction, the schizophrenic tendencies, those sorts of things that we can actually look at and know so much more detail now about prescribing. So we don't have to be naive at all with the prescription of cannabis. So let's dive into a little bit of that. Absolutely. Well, um, I'm glad that you brought this up because um, one thing that, that Dr. Rousseau is um in, in my mind what set him apart was what he postulated which was clinical endocannabinoid deficiency it shows the mind of a true scientist an inquisitive mind because in his thought process he said okay if there's a deficiency of dopamine then we know that it it, it links to parkinson's disease 
if there's a deficiency of, of acetylcholine, then we know that it lends or lends itself to have signs or symptoms of Alzheimer's disease. If there's a deficiency of serotonin or norepinephrine, then that's an indication or leads to depression. So in his mind, he says, okay, what if there's an endocannabinoid deficiency? What happens then? And so he postulated this in 1996, when the oh. first state in the United States had a medical program, California. That's when the medical program started in the United States in 1996, the year that my twin daughters were born, 27 years ago. Wow. In 2016, he wrote this elegant paper on clinical endocannabinoid deficiency and chronic debilitating conditions. And he linked three conditions initially to that, which were, or are rather, fibromyalgia, irritable bowel syndrome, and migraine headaches. But then he went further and discovered that post-traumatic stress disorder, failure to thrive in children, bipolar disorder, chronic fatigue syndrome, all these chronically debilitating conditions are linked in some way, shape, or form to a deficiency in our endocannabinoid system because any type of stress, physical, mental, spiritual, emotional stress, good stress, bad stress, causes a release of endocannabinoids. And so if you're in chronic pain, your body's borrowing from Peter to pay Paul to circumvent and offset that deficiency. So we need cannabis from the outside in to be able to replenish that and maintain, as you stated so beautifully, the homeostasis, the balance. And so it's about maintaining the balance, the homeostasis, and that tonality to be able to have a, a body free of dis-ease or lack of ease. Mm. So from there, now we know the basis. Okay, we've got an endocannabinoid system. We have a deficiency. We must replenish it and this is how we do so so mm -hmm. by doing that it's phenomenal then now we add the component of the genetics i too underwent that genetic testing and i discovered that i am an ultra rapid metabolizer of cbd and mm -hmm. ultra slow metabolizer of thc and a normal metabolizer of ratio based products so it was something that I knew inherently just from trial and error that when I utilized cannabis, THC, products that were rich in THC, all products caused me to have the same experience, but it, they take longer for me to feel the effect, but they last in my system a very long time. Whereas with CBD, I have to double, triple, or quadruple the dose because I'm such a rapid metabolizer. But when I do a ratio-based product, a two-to-one CBD to THC, or a four-to-one CBD to THC product, or a 12 and a half to one CBD to THC product, I find that my body metabolizes it better and I'm more awake, alert, and oriented. So now I know what to use, when to use it. So if I'm going to be sleeping or I've had a really difficult day and my brain is racing a thousand miles an hour, I know that I can kick it up a THC notch, but not use the same dose as someone that's an ultra rapid metabolizer. Yeah. And that that's clinical gold, isn't it? it? It's just so, so amazing to be able to get that data and to get the point and on point with treatment. And it makes a difference to someone's lives so much quicker. It's just incredible. Well, yeah, it's a game changer. In fact, just last night, I was at a dinner conference um, where uh, they're utilizing this these types of genetics to prescribe um, psychiatric medications because mm -hmm. when... When a patient goes to a psychiatrist, typically they'll say, okay, let's start you on this medication. Come back in two weeks or a month because yeah. it takes two weeks for those medications to begin to work and for the patients to notice a difference. They'll yeah. come back and say, no, nope, it, it, I didn't notice any difference. I'm not any better. Okay, well, let's increase the dose. Come back in two, two to four weeks. 
they'll do yeah. that. No, I still feel the same. I'm not feeling any better. Okay, let's change that or let's add to this. And now you're one medication, two medications, three medications. Yeah. Why don't we no just do this? To, why don't we just do the genetic testing from day one? We see how you metabolize. We see whether you're a rapid metabolizer, slow metabolizer, what genetics predispositions you have to certain medications, what um, enzymes are you missing or lacking, what do you have in excess in, and then let's base our treatment on you based on your chemistry. As I stated earlier, I have 27-year-old twin daughters their genetics are 180 degrees apart. They share the same blood type with their father, but yet, chemically speaking, genetically speaking, each one metabolizes medications completely differently. Now, mm -hmm. these are two individuals that have the same mother and father, same DNA, lived in the same womb for 40 weeks, and they are that different. Imagine mm -hmm. someone from Australia and someone from the United States. Yeah, absolutely. And it's a guessing game, isn't it? And really, like you alluded to, it's just try this, try that, oopsies, try this, try that. And there's no real science or data around that <laughs> at all. My goodness. Um, all right. So, Dr. Rosado, I don't want to miss out on time. So, I'm going to go here now. Um, now, it fascinates me to what the turning point, I know you say, you know, a bit about this in your book as well, but what was that turning point for you, that moment or day that you went, you know what, this is this is going to be, it. this is cannabis, like I, I can't go anywhere else right now. Wow. Okay. So, I am an atypical physician in that I learned about the endocannabinoid system in medical school. Okay. So not too many of us can have that claim to fame. I do. <laughs> I was fortunate. Granted, yeah. it was during the toxicology section of my <laughs> pharmacology <laughs> class. <laughs> oh but I, did, I did learn about it. it. It was like two sentences where they mentioned the endocannabinoid system. They talked about the receptors. But immediately they went into it's a gateway drug and it leads people to ruins and et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And it's toxic and so on and so forth. Well, I did not buy that. And so um, I that afternoon I went home and I pulled out my um, pharmacology book and I pulled up cannabis sativa and I read the the classic sentence that changed my thought process forever where it read it is not it does not cause physiological dependence it causes psychological dependence so contrary to alcohol nicotine tobacco cocaine opiates mm -hmm. it does not cause a physiological dependence and or addiction it causes more of a psychological dependence. So now I'm like, okay, this is a good tool for my toolbox, but I left it on the side because where I was studying medicine, it was illegal. And so I didn't even think much about it. In 2010, where it became medically legal in the state of Arizona, one of my very good friends reached out to me and said, hey, I've got property. I'm considering starting this business. I need a physician to be my medical director to set up our dispensary and, and everything. I said, absolutely, sign me up. Let's roll with it. Okay. At that time, his son and my daughters were 14 years of age. And so his wife said, you know, we're teaching our children to abstain from drugs. How can we get involved in marijuana if we're going to teach our children this. So that project was squashed. Fast forward to 2014, when in the state of Florida, uh, one of our very prominent attorneys, Mr. John Morgan, be because of personal history with his father and his brother, and saw how beneficial cannabis was for both of them, decided to fund the campaign to decriminalize cannabis in the state of Florida. 
I saw the ads. I reached out to him, sent him an email on a Sunday stating the following. I'm a physician. I'm an advocate. How do I get involved? Mm -hmm. 24 hours later, I was speaking with his campaign manager. A week later, I was on the Bureau of Speakers. We progressed. As I stated earlier, it didn't. the law did not pass in 2014. We went back to the drawing board in 2016. But that gave me the opportunity to learn more and study and read everything that I could get my hands on written by Mishulam, Hanouj, Dr. Rousseau, Dustin Sulak, Sue Sisley, Margaret Getty, Dr. Uma, and so on and so on and so on and so on. In August of 2016, I was the first in the greater Central Florida area to recommend medical cannabis to a 35-year-old female with a stage 3 brain tumor in her frontal lobe, the front part of her brain, mm -hmm. that she had an inoperable tumor in that area. And so she was in this let's wait and see scenario. Mm -hmm. Knowing that cannabis crosses the blood-brain barrier, we began the treatment. Two years mm. afterwards, she was teaching yoga on the beach in Florida. That's incredible. That case three is months, yeah, oh. three months, yeah, three months after I was the first in the state of Florida to recommend cannabis to a 15 year old boy that had a stage four cancer that was on hospice already with a morphine pump receiving 16 milligrams of morphine every four to six hours for his pain all that child was doing was laying in his hospital bed drooling looking at his crotch because he was so doped up he barely weighed 100 pounds Gosh. we started him on the cannabis within 30 days we cut the dose from 16 milligrams to 8 milligrams he was no longer sitting or laying in his hospital bed he was in the living room in the dining room sharing and spending time with his mother, his stepfather, his brother, his sister. He was the best man at his brother's wedding, danced with his sister at his brother's wedding, asked his mother to make him his favorite meals, was giggling for no reason. As his mom was walking past his room, she would hear him laughing. She'd open the door. Why are you laughing? I don't know, mom. I'm happy. <laughs> So, the, yes, he did pass away the following February of 2017. However, from November of 2016 through February of 2017, his quality of life and the memory that his family has of him makes all the difference in the world. And that was what opened the doors because every time I did anything from uh, August to November, it was documented, it was on social media, it was in mainstream media, and as a result of that, patients, parents were driving four, five, six, seven hours to bring their mm. children to me for me to manage and treat them with cannabis. And mm. that was the turning point. What made me decide to write a book? Because when I first started, aside from all the articles and papers that I read from the individuals I mentioned earlier, I couldn't find any books available that broke it down and made it easy to understand. So yeah. that's exactly. when I took it on. <laughs> exactly. And that's when I, when I started hearing and reading your book, I was like, hallelujah. <laughs> 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 awesome. <laughs> Oh my gosh, you're making me cry, Joseph. Goodness me. Um, <laughs> well, don't cry. <laughs> um, so <laughs> now, you know, 4,000 cases, and I'm assuming it's more, you know, we normally round these things up, but down. So, you know, talk to me, talk me through the, you know, and you have already with these most memorable cases, but, and I'm sure there's so many, but, you know, Step me through your 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 day in the life of a clinic, of a seeing patients, of decision making around cannabis, of you know all those sorts of clinical things, and how you're you're driving your day around this. Obviously, it's case dependent, of course, but you know how do you navigate all of this? Well, I'm glad you asked me this because earlier today I was listening to uh, an interview that was being done uh, by a physician in Mexico. Now, mm. Mexico still does not have an actual law per se, 
they've got bits and pieces of laws, but not an actual law like the different states in the United States. Granted, the United States has 50 states plus multiple territories. Each state has its own rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. That notwithstanding, there's an underlying base for the management and treatment of patients. And the most common reason for patients to seek um, uh, medical cannabis care is to manage and treat their pain, their chronic pain, because they are sick and tired of being sick and tired using medications that are highly dependent, highly addictive, have greater side effects than benefits. They end up uh, causing hypogonadism, causes erectile dysfunction, decreased libido in both men and women, and orgasmia or dysorgasmia in men and women, um, constipation, uh, apathy, et cetera, et cetera. And so one statement that the individual state made that caused me to turn off the interview was when they stated it's an adjunct medication not an alternative and say no i mm -hmm. would rather and i always end my co my conversations with this not that we're ending our conversation now but i always mm -hmm. end my interviews with the following statement i rather give a patient one medication for 10 conditions than 10 medications for one condition this is a medicine and it can replace conventional medications so yeah. the first paper that I published January 6th of 2019 was a case study of a 45-year-old female that was taking between 42 and 58 pills per day. Yes. My her, life, her life revolved around the alarm on her cell phone to remind her when she needed to take her next dose of medication. I consulted her in December of 2017. In February of 2018, she received the card from the state of Florida to be able to purchase her medication. Within 30 days, she was no longer using a short acting opiate because she replaced it with her vaporizer pen. So her breakthrough pain was replaced <laughs> The oxycodone acetaminophen was replaced by a sativa, hybrid, and indica vape pen. Mm -hmm. The extended release opiate took us a few more months to get her weaned off of, which we replaced with tinctures and, and capsules to offset the extended relief effect of the dose. But she was mm -hmm. also on medication for constipation. She was on medication for her attention deficit disorder. So she was on an extended release and an immediate release amphetamine for her ADD, ADHD. She suffered migraine headaches so, and seizures. So she was on medications that treated her seizures and her migraine headaches jointly. She was on medication to offset the constipation. She was on medications to offset the nausea that was caused by all the medications. Well, cannabis works on nausea, so she was no longer having to take the Zofran every four hours to address her nausea because the cannabis was taking care of that. So within three months, she went from 42 to 58 pills a day to three pills a day in three months. Wow. Today, she's strictly and solely on the medical cannabis. She's mm -hmm. not utilizing any conventional medication for anything. She lost over 50 pounds. She stopped smoking cigarettes. She had issues with menopause. She was having hot flashes. THC lowers body temperature, so it addressed her hot flashes. She was no longer apathetic. She was no longer and orgasmic, so now she was able to enjoy her husband. Her husband was able to enjoy her. When her husband came to my office and with tears in his eyes tells me, I have my wife back, my children have their mother back, 
she was working part time as a volunteer, whereas before she was unable to leave her house because wow. she was fearful of leaving her house for fear that she would not be able to take her medication in time. That's no way to live. She was a slave to pharmacology. Yeah. And now she's free and she was freed by the plant. Yeah, exactly. And all while you're saying that, I just, I, I think about the art that it takes to create a treatment plan and even to maneuver that medication out and the plant in. Um, it's just such an incredible art form. And, you know, a lot of, I feel medicine has become, you know, and I hate to say this, I don't mean anything by it, but it's a bit lazy. You know, it's like you're, you're, you're prescribing because it says that you need to do that for this condition. You're not, you're not utilizing your skill and your creativity and your, your, your knowledge of what these are and within the system. So I feel like it's just a, such a, a, a better, cleverer art gift to be able to give these things to patients or this medicine to patients yeah well what what many of my colleagues forget is that medicine is an art a science and a philosophy yeah and we exactly. hear we we think strictly and solely about the science and we come very left brain but we forget that the body does not read the textbook and just because i use this medication on case in point one of my twin daughters i cannot mm -hmm. use that same medication on my other twin daughter because yeah. she will be bouncing off the walls it's the same yeah. thing with the cannabis i can give one of my twins a specific chemovar not strain because there are no strains in plants. There are family, genus, species, subspecies. Strains are existing in bacteria and viruses. So if I give one of my daughters a specific chemovar with a specific set of terpenes, which we did, haven't addressed yet, which is what gives the plant the smell and the taste, but also a medicinal component, you know, whether it's limonene or linalool, or pinene, or carry off, beta caryophyllene, or myrcene, or humulene, and each one addresses a different area in conjunction with uh, the different phytocannabinoids and their different concentrations. If I give that to one of my twins, it's her medicine, but that's not the same medicine for my other twin. And so the incorporation of genetics and listening to the patient and giving them a journal and having them journal. That's how I work with my patients. We have, we give them a journal day one here, log what you buy, write down what you're taking, how you're taking it. This is the guide that I'm giving you. But when I see you next month, let's discuss how you've been doing and what you've been doing. And let's go from there. And in the next month because for the first 30 days i don't take them off of any medication i leave them on the same meds because it mm -hmm. takes 30 days at least 30 days for their endocannabinoid systems to kind of normalize and build up that homeostasis and afterwards then we start picking and choosing okay let's start weaning you off of this medicine let's start and then we could get them off of that one okay now let's go on to the next one and the next one and the next one because we start low and go slow. That's everyone's mantra that's involved in this world. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. And beautifully said. And you're, you know, you were talking about the entourage effect, which we didn't even get to today. We didn't even get next to close visit. To our, our next interview. <laughs> we definitely have to do another one now because there's so many other things I had to talk to you about. But we've only just scratched the surface. But I love to finish a podcast on specifically because this is called Smarter Not Harder. But we really love to ask you three things that you like to be or doing or suggest or live by to live smarter, not harder. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> Just to drop that on you. <laughs> well, I mean, that, that is one of my mottos. I, I, I tell that to my staff all the time. We need yeah. to work smart, not hard. 
Um, mm-hmm. So working smarter, not harder, number one would be listening to our bodies. Uh-huh. We want to impose our left brain and want to uh, encase, label, box, scenarios, conditions, diseases into a specific area. And it doesn't work that way. So let's um, be more cognizant of our bodies and listen to our bodies. Our bodies have all of the knowledge within it. We have an innate intelligence. Prior to being a medical doctor, I was a chiropractor. And we always talked about universal intelligence and innate intelligence. And we talked about the power that created the body heals the body. And so we have an innate intelligence within our body that we must listen to to help us work smarter, not harder. Let's work with the body, not work against the body. So that would be the first thing would be to listen to our bodies. Incredible. Second thing is listen to the universal intelligence, whether you call it God, Source, Allah, Buddha, Tao, Confucius. There is a spirit there is an energy that guides directs all of us that for good or bad as i mentioned earlier there are no coincidences accepting and understanding and being flexible enough to mm-hmm. bend but not break and mm-hmm. utilize the laws of nature to manage ourselves, but also as physicians to help and manage our patients. So listen to our bodies, listen to source, and lastly, listen to each other. Love Mm. each other. Love is truly the answer. There are scenarios, patients that I've managed that in my mind, in my left brain, I think I've got nothing for this person. But their belief, their faith, not talking about religion, but their faith in their ability to get well, their faith in their ability to heal, just like that 45-year-old woman that was taking 42 to 58 pills, she had the faith and, and the wherewithal to know that there was a better way. Mm. And because of that, she was able to move forward, move move past the life that she was living and live the life that she's living now. She had the support of a loving husband. She had the support of her parents. She had the support of her children. She had the support of her providers. And that made it that much easier for her to deal with her transition and her changes. So let's be more accepting not i'm not talking about diversity inclusion just accepting accepting situations as they come accepting individuals as they are accepting circumstances as they come cannabis is a plant it's not made in a lab so you may have found the chemo bar that worked for you and is amazing but guess what it's a plant And if the humidity is too high or the temperature is too hot or too cold or it rained too much or it didn't rain enough, we're not going to get the same constitution. And so be tolerant and patient with it and come up with differences and alternatives and know and be accepting of that. Yeah. And that's really a metaphor for life, isn't it? Patience and accepting. (laughs) And I couldn't agree. Uh, as more. I tell my patients, there are patients and then there are patient patients. <laughs> <laughs> yes, I love that. Oh, this has been an absolute pleasure, Dr. Rosado. And I thank you so much for giving your time for us today. And I hope there is another conversation because I definitely have lots more to ask you. We can make this a series. Whatever you want, I'm here for you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. It's a pleasure. And I will see you very soon. (laughs) And I would love to, at some future time, be invited to Australia, have some Vegemite sandwiches and, uh, and, you know, (laughs) have some 
further conversation and have, you know, take this message in mass to all of the different regions in, in your country. Because when I was in Fiji and I had the pleasure of speaking with everyone, you know, individuals on the, you know, in the Pacific Brim, you know, down under as, as we call you guys in the U.S., um, everyone was yearning, everyone was hungry and thirsty for the information that I had. And, mm -hmm. but yet the politicians and, and the government officials and the religious officials were so adamant against this concept, but the citizens were, were begging for it. Yeah, I totally agree. And I've got a good friend of, um, you know, so I, can't prescribe obviously cannabis here but I have a good friend who's a doctor here and he he always says to me he's like it's so lonely <laughs> Jody, <laughs> as a physician with cannabis here in Australia it's so lonely because there's not many that believe in this and I and it makes me so sad <laughs> so we need we need a lot more support um you know flying the flag pole and as much information for people to become and pushing for it here yes people want it but again the the overarching doctor bodies and 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 the, as you said the religion and the politicians it's still scary for them unfortunately and um that's what is needing to be changed so that would be an absolute pleasure to have you here anytime <laughs> well you know who invited me to speak in fiji yeah who the, the Attorney General. Wow. Huh. Funny story, and we'll end with this story. <laughs> he, he was in New York in April of mm. 20, 2019. Mm. And April, you know, 420, April 20th is, you know, 420 is a big uh, holiday in the cannabis industry. Yep. Um, there's a story behind that. Um, but so he's in, in April, he's in New York with his assistant and his entourage, and he's getting ready to board the plane at John F. Kennedy uh, Airport to fly back, and he goes into the bookstore, and he goes to where all the magazines are, and pretty much every cover on every magazine, Newsweek, Time, Rolling Stone, had a cover story on cannabis. Well, Rolling Stone magazine had um, oh the country singer like not Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg is a hip hop artist. Um, oh, oh, Willie Nelson. The, Willie the, Nelson. That yeah. Will, Will, Willie <laughs> Nelson is on the, the cover of Rolling Stone. Yeah. <laughs> Willie Nelson is on the cover of Rolling Stone magazine. So he grabs. So he grabs the Newsweek. He grabs the Rolling Stone. He grabs Time. He grabs all the major news uh, um, magazines. Gets on his plane. They're flying back. He's reading every one of them religiously. He comes across an article in Rolling Stone magazine on the use of cannabis for sports, uh, cannabis and sports. And how it increases endurance and helps with recovery and et cetera. And he's reading all the others and he turns to his assistant and says, this is the only article that has a physician quoted in it. Find me this physician. I want to get a hold of him. I want him to speak at the next AG conference. It was this wow. guy. Wow. I, was in, I was in that magazine quoted. I wrote, I was interviewed for that article. He read that article, talked to his assistant. His assistant went on LinkedIn, found me, extended the invitation. And that December, I was in Fiji speaking to between four and 500 attorneys for the entire Pacific Brim. And when I got off stage, I was, I was almost sequestered because it was, all weekend long, I was having meetings and conferences. I would I would go by the pool and like five or 10 attorneys would come up to me, Dumb. judges, you know, all, and these are all politicians. These are the ones that make the laws. And, and, and they were telling me how wow. the laws were working and how I could help their mother, their grandmother, their wives, their children. Mm -hmm. So 
Let's plan a trip. <laughs> yeah, let's change the world. <laughs> but that's just the beauty of beautiful synchronicities, isn't it? How things can just whoosh, escalate from just one chance little article with a comment and then just boom, off it goes where it's meant to go, which is just incredible, just incredible. Well, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for your time and we will be in contact soon. <laughs> Looking forward to it. Thank you again for your time. Have a wonderful rest of the day. It is uh, 21 11 my time and on the East Coast. So it's 9 yeah. 11 a.m. your time. 10 now because you guys change times and we don't. <laughs> oh, yes, that is true. We're Thank still thanks. recovering from that. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Oh, dear. All right. Well, we'll see you soon. Bye-bye. Thank you again. Bye. Thank you for joining us on another episode of Smarter Not Harder podcast. What an incredible journey through the world of performance and preventative medicine. If you found today's conversation as fascinating as I did, please take a moment to leave us a five-star review on your favorite podcast platform. Your support means the world to us and it helps us reach more curious minds like yours. We hope this episode has left you inspired and equipped with val valuable insights. As we close this chapter, remember that knowledge is power and we're committed to providing you with that one cent solution to those $64,000 questions. Stay curious, keep learning, and we'll be back soon with more insightful episodes. Thanks for being a part of our Smarter Not Harder community. Yeah.